And now on the line is Mullingar historian Jason McCabot. Jason, welcome to the program. Hello, how are you? You keep it going, man. Thank you for inviting me. All right, cool. Jason, I understand that the former Colin Barks in Mullingar is on the lips of a lot of people in Mullingar, even though the Barks closed to the army a few years ago. Before we talk about why the site is in the news now, could you tell our listeners, for those who don't know, a bit about the history of the Barks since it was established up until the present day, please? Well, I suppose Colin Barracks, um, the size, it goes over 200 years in Mullingar, and it's replaced two smaller barracks in the town that were there up to the 18th century. And uh, I suppose in 1807, we see that the site where Colin Barracks now stands was sold by um, the owners of the town, um, the Forbes family. And they, they actually sold it to the war office to build a proper barracks. And in 1807, the tenders went out. Now, you're talking about a period when we're coming into the Peninsular War at this stage. So Ireland, as part of the empire, was actually fighting against Napoleon at this stage. So they needed a bigger barracks. And, of course, yes, there was an awful lot of security issues in Ireland as well. Like, it was only a number of years after the 1798 rebellion. And actually, from that spot, uh, we believe that Lord Longford and his militia defended Mullingar from a United Irishman attack in 1798, having previously... Uh, being a siege in Granard, which is not that far from Mullingar. So, oh. again, the barracks, the barracks kind of, you know, progressed and built up around the town. And I suppose one of the most interesting things about the barracks is that um, it was named Wellington Barracks after the Duke of Wellington, uh, after his uh, victorious uh, Battle of Waterloo in 1815. And one of the ironies about that is actually the Duke of Wellington was married to a local girl, uh, Kitty Packenham from Tully Nally Castle, which is in Castle Pollard, just about a few number of miles outside of Mullingar. So, so there you go. So straight away, you have a link there straight away with history and with the barracks. Mm. So, um, yeah, you know, going into the 18th century, we've had royalty there. Uh, we've had, you know, Prince George of Cambridge. He was there in 1850, just around the time of the famine. And, of course, the last time there was a Prince George of Cambridge uh, current day is actually uh, Prince William's son, who's called Prince George of Cambridge. So, you know, we also had maybe... In Nocturne Castle, just outside of Mullingar, we would have had the Churchill family in 1878. And, of course, the officers from the barracks would have been involved in the hunt. So we've a big connection there as well. So that's much of the 18th century, mm. you know. Mm. So, yeah. Okay, do you want to talk a bit more about the barracks in more recent years? I understand that in 1922 it was transferred to the Irish government, wasn't it? The Irish Army? Uh, that, well, it, it was. It was actually, uh, the barracks in Mullingar is actually interesting because it was actually transferred more than once, if you know what I mean, okay. or, or evacuated and handed over more than once. I suppose the first time was around January 1922 when the East Yorkshire Regiment actually um, evacuated the barracks to leave. And the Sussex Regiment came in as a sort of a cleaning up around the barracks and getting ready for a handover. Uh, we see in February 1922, um, there was a bit of a skirmish. And this is when the old IRA... Uh, began to split the pro-treaty IRA and the anti-treaty IRA. Okay, and we all know that later on that year there was a civil war with both sides. So the pro-treaty IRA became the Irish Army. However, uh, what we did find out was that in February, um, the anti-treaty IRA contingent in the town and in the Midlands actually arrived at the barracks. And one of these officers uh, called Captain Todd Andrews actually took the hand over the barracks from a British officer and was slightly upset, we believe, because uh, as the British were leaving, they didn't leave any liquor or spirits in the officer's uh -huh. mess. Uh -huh. Okay. And, of course, Todd Andrews is actually the grandfather of Ryan Torbody. Oh. So there you go. So there's a connection there. So that was the first time it was handed over. However, what happened then was about that evening and the next day, the RIC was being disbanded at the same time. So, again, we had uh, Mullingar was one of those major centres which was used to actually disband the Royal Irish Constabulary. So they were brought from the west of Ireland to Mullingar to actually be disbanded. So the anti-treaty IRA then evacuated the barracks themselves and then they took over the county hall in Mullingar, the courthouse and the old police barracks while this uh, demobilisation of the RIC was taking place in Mullingar. Uh, we see then in April then that the pro-treaty IRA, or the Irish Army, the Free State Army, they then took over the barracks, and uh, General Ginger O'Connell, he was there for the taking over and the handover of that. So we can see the barracks twice it was actually handed over, and then 
three times evacuated in the space of about four months. Oh. Okay. And it remained. And of course, then we had the Mullingar crisis related to that because in Mullingar in April, late April 1922, a full two months before the civil war was declared uh, with the four courts in Dublin, etc., uh, we see that we had a thing called the Mullingar crisis in that there was a standoff between the pro-treaty IRA and the anti-treaty IRA, okay, the Free State Army and the Irregulars, okay. Mm -hmm. And that standoff took place in Mullingar, and a young army officer, young Lieutenant Patrick Collum, Free State Army, and he was shot in Mary Street, uh, where the current uh, cathedral is now, and he was killed there, so he was. So the barracks was named after him, Colum Barracks. Mm -hmm. We also, on the same date, we had Joe Levy on the Irregular side, was actually shot just down below at Mary Street there, going into Dominic Street. And it is believed from reports that it was the Dublin Guard who were loyal to Collins who actually shot them. Okay, oh. so we can see a full two months before official uh, civil war took place that skirmish was going on in Mullingar, and that's kind of known by historians as the Mullingar Crisis. So even at the start of the founding of the state, Mullingar was actually at the centre of everything. Oh, you know. Cool. And so, and then after that, the uh, barracks stayed open uh, for the Irish Army to use until 2012, I believe it was. Does that what happened? Uh, that's, that, that's right. It remained open until uh, 1929, 1930, and the regular army kind of pulled out then. You know, they were reducing the size of mm -hmm. uh, the Irish Defence Forces at this stage. However, during the 1930s, while there was no regular army in it, it was a reserve training centre. And what we can actually see is that res volunteer reserve units, especially De Valera's volunteer reserve, actually trained regularly in the barracks, and it was a main recruitment depot for the volunteer reserve. Mm -hmm. So let's say you joined, uh, let's say, the Oriel Regiment or the Regiment of Oshnock, as we're known, because all these little volunteer regiments had these little ancient titles on them, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Like the Westmead would have been known as Oshnock due to the Hill of Oshnock. Oh. And they would have trained in the barracks during the 1930s. Now, the barracks was used for other things, circuses and everything, a bit like Castle Bar in latter days. However, the, with the breakout of the Second World War, or the emergency, as we call it, the regular army came back into the barracks in 1939. And again, links with Dublin, they would have the old 20 battalion came down from Dublin. And of course, my grandfather's regiment uh, came down, the 11 Dublin Volunteers. And my, the 11 Dublin Volunteers that my granddad was involved with uh, was also Major Vivian de Valera, the son of Eamon de Valera, was oh. in the barracks during that period. And they actually headquartered in Nocturne Castle, just outside of the barracks. Oh. Okay, so, so, so there you go. So you can see that kind of... And from thirty nine, the regular army remained in situ until its closure in 2012. And I mean, again, in intermittent, in between that period, then we also had issues there. We, you know, we had uh, Irish soldiers mostly from Mullingar, and not going in Galway, but mostly Mullingar, and they went out to the Congo and were involved in the siege of Jadotville, uh, uh -huh. out there. So we know that was turned into a movie later, uh -huh. and uh, you know, with Jamie Dornan, and there's still a couple of those veterans still alive here in Mullingar, like Billy Kane and Tom Gunn, to name but a few, and Tom uh -huh. Cunningham indeed, and they're still surviving, and these are the survivors of Jadotville. And my own grafter then, around just a month after Jadotville, a month or two after Jadotville, fought the Battle of the Tunnel in the Congo. So. You can actually see that working out there. Um, also, the barracks, I suppose, uh, in 1976 became, I suppose, of national and international importance because Paddy Donegan, a Minister for Defence, Fine Gael Minister for Defence, came down to open a cookhouse. Now, a cookhouse in the military would be what civilians would call a canteen. Hmm. You know, it'd be where you go to have your dinner, that sort of stuff. But we, in the military, they call it a cookhouse. Hmm. So, of course, he was opening it up and he kind of went away from the script and uh, the president of the time, uh, President Carvalho Dolig, who was himself a former judge, uh, tried to look at the constitutionality of new anti-terrorist acts that the Fine Gael government was bringing in. And remember, the president up until Mary Robbins, there were always Fianna Fáil. Mm. Okay, so there, there would have been always tension between the Fine Gael government and the presidency, anyway, even though there shouldn't be, mm. but there's always a, something undercurrent there at, up to 1990. Mm. So what we see is that Carvalho Dolig referred it uh, to the Supreme Court, and, of course, Paddy Donegan's Ministry of Defence felt this was shocking. Like, you know, they should have been, they should have been just allowed to go straight through. And he called him a tundra in disgrace. And now uh, some people assume that uh, much stronger words were used. But uh, from what I found out from research, I don't think so. And did you actually call but, him in Mullingar, was it? Uh, yeah, it was in Mullingar oh. in the cookhouse. Yeah. Oh, and what people... Yeah. 
Yeah, there you go. And what people forget is that on Ukraine the Heron, the President of Ireland is not just the President of Ireland, but they're also the Commander in Chief of the Irish Defence Forces, Oglig mm. the mm. So to insult uh, the President in front of Irish troops is the greatest insult to the President because you're insulting him or her in front of their army, their mm. navy, their air corps, their reserve, because they are the Commander in Chief. Mm. So, of course, Colonel O'Dalek took umbrage to this. And it was a bit of a standoff, and Liam Cosgrove, who was Taoiseach, wouldn't sack his Minister of Defence, even though, in fairness to Paddy Donegan, he offered it. And uh, so what happened was, being the man he is, Carvel O'Dolic decided to resign from office, and he did, because he felt his position had been tarnished by being called a thunder and disgrace and being undermined in front of the state, and especially in front of Defence Forces. So, so there you go. We can see that there, even in 1975, national importance, international even. You know, this is the talk of the world at the time, you know, mm. president resigning. Mm. So so that was that, you know, and, and of course Mullingar, I suppose, what another thing about it is, it was the only sole artillery barracks in Ireland, in the Republic of Ireland. In other words, there was no infantry units, there was no cavalry. This was sole artillery, you know, oh. regimental. And and it was like a family because you had the reserve defence forces, you know, and Force of Casanta Autul, which later became the army reserve, and you had the regular army. And Everyone was just a gunner. It didn't matter whether you were a lieutenant colonel, whether you were a sergeant major, whether you were a sergeant, a corporal, or, a gu- or a gu- indeed a gunner itself. Everyone was a gunner in that artillery family. And, of course, we were all related, as you can imagine. I mean, Mullingar people have been serving in that barracks since his actual construction uh, mm. between 1807 and 1814. You know? So, mm. you know, it very much part of who we are as Mullingar people. Okay, can you tell me a bit about how the army barracks closed and how much of a shock that was to the people of Mullingar? Well, it was it was a great shock. How it closed, and you know, here's the deal. I mean, typical uh, government stuff on public mm. service. In that, millions were spent on the barracks up till its closure on the 20th of March, 2012. And I suppose what happened there, we had austerity. We had a country that was, you know, bankrupt for all intents and purposes. That's what it was. Mm. And the government allegedly had to make savings. So they decided to close barracks around the country, Garda barracks and army barracks and whatnot. And of course, at the time in Mullingar, you know, we had a junior minister at the time, uh, the first super junior minister, Willie Penrose. Um, Willie's a great guy, just a very sound guy. If you ever met Willie, he's just real down to earth type of guy. And of course, Willie being in government, Mullingar's first minister, if you like, you know, oh. and he defended the town and he just said, no, 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 the barracks can't close. And of course, this is the Labour Fine Gael coalition. And Alan Shatter said, no, no, it's closed. And, and there was a standoff. So Willie Penrose actually resigned from government. And of course, I'm sure Willie Penrose at a later date will actually be able to fill us all in about what oh. the finer details were of that, you know, because Willie is well able to speak for himself in fairness to him. And it'd be very interesting to find out you know, the ins and outs of what actually happened at that time. Mm. But, however, it was announced the barracks closed, and here was the, the kick in the teeth for an awful lot of members of Defence Forces. Was remember, this is a Fine Gael Labour government, and it was actually around the time of the presidential elections in 2011. Mm. And on the day, okay, so the rumours were going around the barracks was going to close, it was rumours, and nothing was confirmed, okay? Mm. Nothing confirmed. And next thing, the 11th of November, 2011, and I remember it well, because it's Armistice Day, and the Defence Forces, regular and reserve, were up at Collins's Barracks from uh, in Dublin. And they had went up to fire the cannons because it was an artillery barracks and it was a 21-gun salute to the President. Mm. Okay? The inauguration of Michael D. Higgins. Mm. Michael D. was inaugurated as President of Ireland, Uthra and the The 4th Regiment and 5-4 Regiment from Mullingar went up, fired a salute as artillery gunners, mm. as they do when the President is being inaugurated. Yeah. Within a week, it was then officially announced the barracks was closing. So it was yeah. like the Fine Gael Liberal government. It was a kick in the teeth because yeah. one of theirs had been elected. They kept it, you know, they tried to not go official about it. There was rumours flying left, right and centre. But as soon as that was done and the president was in, the, the election was over. The Mullingar gunners had fired their 21 guns. Out. Then a week later, then it was announced closing. And, and it was pandemonium. I'll be honest with you. It was pandemonium Mullingar. I mean... Yes, I'm a historian. I'm a teacher, first and foremost, but I also come from a military family, you know. So uh, I suppose my family, I served as a reservist, but my brothers and my father and my grandfather served as regular army. So I'm the fourth generation or because even my granny's father before he served there during the First World War. So a fourth generation of military. 
So amongst military people in Mullingar and their families in Mullingar, it was like a punch in the face, to be honest with you. I mean, the barracks had been all done up, the brand new pistol range, state-of-the-art equipment in the barracks, you know, ablutions, accommodation. The barracks were flying. And, and I know from talking to maybe people who were involved in accounts in the barracks, like senior quartermasters in the barracks, and they maintained that to keep the barracks running, it, it was something like 400,000 a year, mm-hmm. okay, which is nothing in the, in the grand scheme of things. 400,000 a year. Okay, yes, you know, some business people uh, did a tally on this, but it was worth to the local economy of Mullingar in the area. It was in the region. Now, these are approximate figures from what I've been told. was in the region of 9 to 10 million a year. Mm. You know, because oh, yeah. Mullingar, you see, from the month of June to August, you would have had reserve training in Mullingar. So these mm. guys were coming, girls were coming to Mullingar. They were spending money. You, it would have been uh, the UN training there as well, so accommodation for guys training to go overseas with the Defence Force. So there was all spending money, recruits being trained in the barracks, and, you know, this is spending all in the local economy, and now here it was going to be pulled away. So even the business people were upset, let alone the military mm-hmm. family. So it was just shock, and it was anger. It was anger for 400000 a year. Oh, That's all it was, yeah. you know. And yet they spent millions after that doing up other barracks uh, for the displaced soldiers, you know, and you know, it was just ridiculous considering what was worth the local economy. It was, it, it was. Some people feel it was very spiteful act. Mm. You know, we understand the austerity, but for four hundred thousand a year, like mm. something that was, and there was job losses, by the way, because people say, you know, well, there was no job losses. Like these soldiers were transferred. Well, some of them retired on that. You know, when that happened, who were entitled to their pension, but there was civilian staff who worked in the barracks and they lost their jobs. Mm. You know, there was, you know, especially in the catering industry, because we, we had a, a catering company, a private catering company who used to look after the, the cookhouse itself. And that staff were, you know, hmm. they lost their jobs. Hmm. Do you know, so there was job losses. I mean, pulling the, the closure of Colin Barracks, Mullingar, it was like Dell in Limerick closing. Hmm. That's what that was like to Mullingar. Do you know, hmm. it pulled the heart over that at the time. But in fairness, Mullingar is a very resilient town. I mean, you know, so people try to bounce back. But yeah. It, it was like pulling a Dello of Mullingar. That's exactly what it was like. Mm. I saw a video on the YouTube channel Mullingar News and Views of Eamon Gilmore just before he entered government, a year or two before the barracks closed, c- committing himself to and his party to keep the barracks open. That must, have, that must have seemed terrible after him. Like It was only a year or two beforehand that he said that he was going to and do his best to ensure that the barracks would remain open. So I'm sure that was very, um, that, that was hard hitting, was it? Yeah, well, that, it was, and, and that gets back to the point, uh, because like Eamon Gilmore exactly said that, and I know the person who actually uh, made that recording and fair play to the person. Um, but it was, it was very hurtful and, and it was very hard to, uh, very hard pill to swallow mm-hmm. because when Eamon Gilmore did that Labour Party we get back then to Michael D as president the Labour Party uh. president being elected so now you get back to the point in that yeah it was really that we were we were screwed uh. by Labour and government to uh. be honest with you and uh, I, I, sp- I speak for myself at the time I was vice chair of the Labour Party in Mullingar and I resigned from it uh. over the whole thing uh. you know but as I said I do know Willie Penrose, in fairness, Labour Party aside or Fine Gael aside or any party aside, Willie is a just decent guy, yeah. do you know. And, you know, and look, when history is written about Colin Barracks, I'm sure it's going to write very favourably about Willie Penrose and the sacrifice he made at that time. Mm. You know, and I know people have said that Willie should have stayed on and he could have got something else. But you know what? Willie is a, he's a good guy. He's a good yeah. guy and he's a man of honour, in fairness to him. And history will be kind to Willie. Yeah. Uh, okay. Be, be, before we talk about the kind of latest news, what's happening w- with the site at the moment uh, of the barks, you actually created a radio documentary recently on the barks, didn't you? Uh, yes, it was involved in a couple of radio documentaries. You no, know, Ruth Healingworth and I, we were involved with one there with Shannon said Northern Sound, and I was involved with one there with Midlands Radio Three. Uh, yeah, that's right. And it was kind of just the history of the barracks and just highlight the fact that, you know, that there is historical significance there. It's part of who we are. And again, one of the things about it is that I've researched a lot in the barracks and I'm putting together the findings. And as anyone would tell you who writes, especially when it's historical writing, you know, there's a lot of research goes into it. And normally because I didn't have the p- findings published just yet, you would hold it close to your chest. Mm. 
But then when we were hearing that the LDA are planning to build houses on the camp, fi- well, we believe the camp field is what I've been told, but we don't know. Mm. That's the thing. That there's supposed to be houses built here. Uh, and first phase is between 100 and 200 houses, we believe. Okay, it's, it's mm. all very cloak and dagger stuff. All we see on the LDA site is what they're stating. And I suppose what I decided to do then when I was getting wind of this was highlight the history that I've researched thus far. And I emphasize thus far because I'm still researching it and I'm still finding the huge stuff about the barracks. Do you know? And as I said there earlier, normally you would hold that close to your chest until you publish it in a pamphlet or a Mm. book or a booklet or something. But I just felt that with the the structures being under threat that I had to release some sort of my research Mm. on the barracks to highlight, look, let's not, let's be very careful here what we're at. Do you know? Mm. Because you know, and th- there is this mindset with some people, and I heard it said when the idea of houses being constructed up in that area of town, they were saying, oh, sure, look, it's only an old British hangover. I sure it's only an old British establishment to control the Irish. And you get this nonsense, okay? Uh. Look, our history is what it is. We look at history. History's not there to be liked. Uh. History's not there to be disliked. History is what it is. And if people get offended by it, well, good, then it's doing its job so. Do you know what I mean? Uh. We learn from history. Do you know? it's We can't create a magical... Uh, uh, Irish narrative and go mm. everything was all you know lovely in heaven Irish history is not like that there's a lot of grey areas as well as black and white do you know what I mean mm. but you know people have been saying they're all oh, up pull it down I said what about houses was an establishment do we go to Dublin and do we pull down our Snooktron because that was the Vice Regal Lodge mm. do we go into Dublin and do we pull down Dublin Castle because that was you know mm. the centre of British intelligence now no we don't of course we don't mm. do you know that's history we move on and it's the same with the barracks so when we hear some people suggesting, oh, look, there's only an old British hangover or whatever. No, 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 no. We need to be. It's part of who we are. It's mm. history and heritage. Okay. And how real is the prospect, do you think, that the whole site will be demolished to make way for housing? Well, I'll be honest with you. We don't know because the LDA haven't stipulated where it's going. We have the camp field, okay, and people are saying they'll go in there. Now, the barracks on this camp field is 25 acres, okay? Mm. But... The thing with the camp field, you're looking at access and egress. I mean, this is a bottled in, this uh, camp field. I mean, you have a house set one side, a house set another side, and then you have old cottages another side of it. So the only way in or out properly is by the, through the barracks. Mm. Okay, because if you go into another housing estate that backs onto that, it'd be just too much traffic. It'd be just way too much in there mm. to be health and safety issues. If you go another way down by the Patrick Street entrance, I mean, that's too tight and narrow. So the only other way to get out for access and egress is through the barracks itself or through part thereof. Okay. Mm. Now, that part of town in Mullingar is in the center of the town. Now, we, we have, you know, we hear about environmentalists and we hear about green people and all this. And, you know, why would we be putting congestion in a town center? It's pedestrianizing a town you need to be doing at this stage, mm. not putting more congestion. When about half a kilometre behind the barracks on the link road, you've loads of green fields there. Mm. You know, so you're not talking about miles, really, but maybe half a kilometre behind the barracks. 500 yards, 500 metres, you have green field sites. But how likely is it? We just don't know. Now, in fairness to the two TDs I've been talking to who've been in contact with me, Robert Troy from Fianna Fáil and Peter Burke from Fine Gael, and those two guys have been absolutely brilliant. They, they've mm. been trying to keep me up to speed, look, we think it might be more the camp field, but, but in fairness, we don't know, and they don't really know themselves. They're assuming it's the camp field, okay? Hmm. But will this impact on the barracks itself? Maybe. We, we have to see the plans, and from what my understanding of uh, how the LDA operates, and again, this is a new organization, hmm. but from my understanding, what I've been told, these guys go in, they design the place, and then they consult with Mm. stakeholders around the area. So they have their designs done before they talk to people. They don't talk to people first and base their designs on what people are saying. Mm. They actually go in, have their designs ready, this is what we're doing, and then now we're going to tell you what we're doing. Do you know, Mm. that sort of thing. And that thing, that that costs money. So how likely is the part of the barracks can be damaged? Very likely. Am I 100% convinced of it? I just don't know. We don't know. And this is where we need, you know, with a new government, when the LDA finally... it's signed in that the LDA are in charge of the site, that then they can tell us what's happening. And you see, when you vague information, it creates all sorts of conspiracy theories. Mm. Yeah? yeah? And, you know, and it's not that I'm against development in any way. I am just against development if it's going to impact on something so historically important. 
Uh, that's where I step in. Again, I'm not a politician. I'm a local historian. You know, I, I, I'm not there to stand on a soapbox and dictate government policy. That's not my issue. My issue is the protection of history and heritage. And all local historians and all historians around the country, that's what we do. Hmm. That's what we do, is to protect the history and heritage of a locality. Uh, uh, you know? Uh, so, so how likely? We don't know. We need to see. We need to see everything. And there's no one denying anything. Uh, Let's just say... All we know is that there is suppositions that, well, we don't think so. We think it'll be the camp field. And in fairness, the two TDs that I've been talking to have been brilliant, you know, and trying to keep me informed. But they're not 100% accurate themselves because they don't know. We haven't seen the plans. Mm. All we know, if you go on the LDA website, it's between a phase one, and I emphasize phase one, yeah. is one to 200 houses. And that's phase one. So how many more phases is there? Uh, and, uh, you know, we don't know. And part of the box has been used now for the last few years, isn't it? Uh, yes. Well, uh, I mean, it's used by some community groups. I mean, uh, you know, you have musicians in there. You have a youth club. You know, you have Frank Byrne there, Run Die Project there. Uh, he's a musician. He's doing great works for the kids in Mullingar. You have some sort of education facility there. You have a boxing club. Um, you have all that within the bag. Now, again, I don't speak for those people, in fairness, you know, and I'm sure that they will be able to speak for themselves, in fairness to them. But, uh, but, yeah, you have a lot of community groups there. And you have the Irish United Nations Veterans Association made up of ex-soldiers who actually served in the barracks. Mm -hmm. And they have uh, headquarters there as well. Uh, and also, you have the Gar on Garda Shekana used the barracks. Oh. Because we still have the pistol range. Like, if you remember earlier, I was saying that they spent millions on the barracks before yeah. the closing. They're the state-of-the-art pistol range in the barracks. Mm -hmm. And the guards are using it, you know. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Like, and, mulling, and like, it's not that... It's secret, because if you live in Mullingar, you can hear the gunfire, mm. <laughs> you know. Like, Mullingar is not like Dublin. It's a big town, but, you know, you can hear a gunshot round in it, you know, and mm. you can hear the, the rounds being fired on the pistol range, you know. So, so there you go. So these are some of the groups. But as I said, they can, you know, speak up more for themselves. Like, you know, I'm not their spokesperson, and I, you know, I don't want to go in there and speak for them because I'm not appointed to do that, you know. Yeah, I think it'd be good, though, if, if the organisations were still able to use the building or part of it you know it'd be great oh absolutely yeah. absolutely i mean i mean i mean in fairness i mean once there's it's been used and it's been kept there it's better than to wither on the vine do you know uh, what i mean uh, okay do you know i know on board planola can make sometimes appalling decisions i can think of, of in the last couple of years of developments in blanchardstown kulak and recently in Rakarn and the Guelph talking mead. I'm thinking of developments that have been given the go ahead uh, in recent years, which went against the wishes of the local communities. But uh, I, I personally find it re remarkable that they could actually knock down a two hundred over two hundred year old former army barracks. You know, given the, it, be, it, it would be uh, unbe it'd be incredible. I think if that happens, you know. Well, that well, you see, it depends what's protected. Hmm. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I mean, yes, the blocks are protected, the church is protected, but there are certain other buildings, like the cookhouse wouldn't be protected. Yet, a very historic event occurred in the cookhouse. It mm -hmm. only dates from 1976, as I was saying earlier, mm -hmm. but that can be pulled down. Yes, it's of, you know, historic importance when you consider a president of Ireland resigning. Um, yeah, but, but you see, we're not talking about bulldozers going in and knocking it straight away and go away, hey. But what you could do is open the windows and let Mother Nature knock it for you. Mm. There you go. And then when a the developer goes in and goes, well, do you know, this is not viable anymore. Do you know, it's better to knock it than to keep it. <laughs> and you can have stuff like that, you know. But the mm -hmm. barracks is not in that state, you know. In fairness, it's she's w weathering after eight years of, you know, no constant use by the military mm -hmm. because they really maintained it. But look, you, you don't know what could happen. I mean, I mean, look at Clancy Barracks in Dublin. You still have the old buildings there, but you have skyscrapers now around the barrack square. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, you can still build mm -hmm. and incorporate the buildings. But the thing is, such a historic site. Will, will we build houses in Oris Nukteron or will we put a house in the state in the middle of uh, Dublin Castle? Do you know? So that you, sort of thing. Would you be in favour personally of no houses getting built on the site or, or just some well, part look, of it? Well, look, I mean, I'd be honest with you, uh, there's a perfect greenfield site not far from the barracks there. Mm. And I think environmentalists would be able to speak better of the location of where... Uh, these houses should be, but should it be built in the middle of the Barrack Square in Mullingar and incorporate all the buildings? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think uh, there's other things can happen at barracks that, you know, we could we could look at an education facility for it. You can look on it for a museum. You can look at it for, 
you know, some people who've spoken to me there, um, Mullingar, who are in the music scene, and saying it'd be a great uh, concert venue. Uh, you know, would, the yeah. acoustics of the square. Do you know? I mean, look, there, there's people with more foresight and all that stuff when it comes to what the possibilities are with the barracks than maybe I am. I mean, I suppose as a historian, we kind of look back on the history of it, but there's people with better views of what could be done with it without houses going there. Do you know what I mean? Uh, and I mean, of course, the housing crisis is very important, and it is important that the government start building houses. I mean, I'm not against that at all. It's just maybe the site may not be right especially if it's in the barracks itself. If it's out in the camp field, you know, that's another issue. That's an issue for a board planola to look at and access and egress to that site. That's up to them. But the actual structures itself, I personally don't think that the structures itself should become housing. I, I don't think they'd be fit to become housing, to be honest with you. And, mm. you know, especially with social distancing now and everything, you know, mm. we have to take that in. And you know. do we know when we're going to hear, like, the next step of the plans for the development? When it's going to be? Uh, <laughs> that's the thing. I don't. Uh, None of us do. Like, like all, all I know is that they're waiting for a new government to actually uh, sign the barracks over to the LDA because uh, what I'm hearing is that the LDA, it's only a formality. Okay? Yeah. It's still in the Department of Defence hands uh, and they just formalise it over to the LDA but it has to be a minister there to do that. There has to be a government. So okay. there has to be a new doll. Yeah, so that has to be, the new government has to form for that to be signed in. Uh, so the plans, no, and, and that's why everyone is kind of wondering what's going on, because we don't know. Okay. Yeah? Yeah. We just don't know. We, yeah. we, there's nothing. All we know is what's on the LDA website. And if you go onto the LDA website and look in for Colin Barracks Mullingar, you will actually just see, you have this uh, CGI image, this computerized image of the barracks, and that's it. But And on, on it then you have, you know, the area where... You know, there's going to be a site uh, location. But but that's it. 100 to 200 houses, phase one. Phase one. So, uh, you know, so there could be a phase two, phase three, phase four, phase five. We don't uh, know. Uh, okay. You know. I'll, I'll come back to you again at some stage in the future uh, to do another interview if that suits, uh, if there's more, when there's more yeah. reviews, you know. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay, Jason, come towards the end of the interview, what are you calling on all interested parties, including a lot of the public, to do on this issue or story? Uh, I suppose that the, the most important thing is, is that when we find out exactly what's happening, because we can't jump a gun and say this is happening, because we, again, I keep emphasizing we don't know, mm. because <laughs> we don't know. But I think is most important is to highlight the historic significance of the barracks and the people protect the barracks. Like, people power is better than any other power. And I mean, if the LDA go in there and decide that they're going to put a skyscraper in the middle of it, which they probably wouldn't, do you know, yeah. I'm being a little bit facetious. But if they did, I think all people can do is just go to their TDs, go to county councillors and say, no, no, sorry, guys, we're not having this. History and heritage is more important to us here. On that site, there's loads of green fields around Mullingar. Do you know, as yeah. I said, within five, half a kilometre behind the barracks, there's a green field site all along that link road, you know, which may be better. But okay. all I'm saying is, is make your voice known that when we know what's happening. Okay. That's the thing. And, and, and also, let's hope that there's someone listening in going, right, okay, we'll have to change our plans here because if we do what we think we're going to do, then there's going to be trouble. And no one wants trouble or anything like that. And the most important thing that there is houses built for people that need them. Do you know, and I, I want to emphasize that. Hmm. Just maybe not necessarily on that historic site itself, but within half a kilometer, 500 meters, absolutely. Mm. you know or wherever but 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 again we have to know the plans first mm. you know